Okay, well, let's get started. So we had a, a really wonderful group of post submissions, and it was quite hard for us to choose a few to give flash talks, but we have ended up with three that I think um, cover a wide range of gradient topics. So each give a three to five minute talk, maybe just one question afterwards each, and then I'll direct you just to talk to them more at their posters later on today. Uh, so first up, we're going to have Bianca Berger. Yeah, I think everything's good. Yeah. Okay, uh, so hello everybody. I'm Yakuba yeah. from the Reputation Research Lab at Melbourne University of Vienna, led by Professor Kiyo Nance. And I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to talk today. So um, the purpose of the work I presented today was to start with genetic influence on functional and subject variability. So the traditional way is actually to kind of anatomically align subjects and then um, correlate which have interest in the maritime series with the literature. But here we actually see um, this type of subject variability as a mixture of other types of variability. So the first one. We actually um, just the variability of pure connectivity strength, which you can see here by the different thicknesses of each of the first connecting lines. So the doubts on the brain are mutually interest and combines other connections. And the other type of variability is um, some kind of topographic variability, which um, we interpret here as slightly different positions of function activity, activity that is um, mutually interest. And to study um, the reliability of both features, we actually had this angle for first two types of reliability. And we did that um, using a functional alignment technique where we aligned um, yeah, the functional units of each subject to the functional units of the reference. And this um, allows us to study those two types of reliability independently. And then we actually could. Um, apply a twin model to our data, but we actually use um, fMRI data from the monitoring project um, to um, yeah, estimate genetic influence on both types of reliability. And here we actually already see um, the maps. Um, here are our full results. So um, in the so for a speed, a little row of maps that they actually can share the flat on the left down to topography to the lower end of the topography, and you see that here uh, the shared flats are shows the last peaks um, compared to the surface um, above, which is um, shared influence to a table variability. On the other hand, um, the surface on the bottom, which is um, the disentangled connectivity strain. Shows um, decreased genetic influence to variability. And what's quite interesting so, um, genetic influence to the top, so proper variability seems to be more um, heterogeneous across the projects. And it's we found out that there is no kind of increase of um, genetic contributions to the subject variability <laughs> when going from primary or when you get to higher situation areas. And we also found that. The more topographic variability you have, um, the higher is the genetic contribution to these variabilities. There's a positive correlation. And taking everything together, we kind of suggest that there is um, a coordinated topographic framework, so um, coordinated fashions, so there really is more coordinated fashions. And on top of this, um, actually, the connectivity strain of the variability in X, which is more um, influenced by environmental. Change uh, other more by, by, <coughs> sorry, and um, more influenced by the environment. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, some different so could be a different sources of this um, reliability topography. And we don't know what it is, but it could either be that there is some kind of um, in the past that there were different genotypes equally fit. Or it could be that there were changing environmental conditions and different genotypes were more quick than others at a certain time, which would increase um, the thickness of the whole population. And in my opinion, it makes also kind of sense because the population could also be just a small, um, a small bunch of people or a group 
and it makes kind of sense if the brain is probably working differently, which might also mean that they are better in different kind of abilities. And this is what appropriates the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, that was basically it. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Maybe I'll ask a question. So, um, with the differences across the um, new networks, but they're also variability within the networks substantial as well. Or is, do you think the functional networks are the best way to decompose the variability? Um, yeah, it's, it's right. There's also some kind of um, variability within the networks, but we try to keep it kind of simple. That's why you need to stage those new networks because they also. I mean, they have nice organization it's just a few web networks and there's always we can um assign the set of different networks also to more functional and we really put a more um, functional structure like um, passing a negative to the default network and has positive with um quantifier to the attention networks and those are the primary areas so we kind of <laughs> so the functional interpretation yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, next up we have Yong Hyun. That's all right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> so first of all, thanks for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my work. Um, my work is about the effective connectivity at the whole brain level. So give the motivation as a neuroscientist, I wanted to understand the system, but the representation level wasn't enough, and I wanted to understand the underlying interaction structure. <laughs> But the problem was that there are just so many algorithms and studies using different mathematical or algorithms with different mathematical mathematical backgrounds. So, and this led to many meta-analyses with many studies. But I thought that that wasn't enough. And but this kind of situation left us with unsatiable desire to go from functional connectivity to effective connectivity. And I thought that to progress the field, we need a better or better methodology that, it, that can incorporate various algorithms that has been proposed so far. And to that end, I first extensively studied algorithms with different mathematical backgrounds. And this is the category that I made. And these, both, these algorithms with all both, both characters are the algorithms that, that I used. And this is the example of results that I got using the simulation of the resting state bold uh, signal and then analyze the underlying structure using this representative algorithm. <clears throat> and then having picked these representative algorithms, I trained an ensemble regression model to kind of map each algorithm's estimates to the ground state. And this is the result from the simulation model showing that this ensemble regression model showing better performance than any other uh, individual algorithm. And then interestingly, the more algorithms that we incorporated, the better it was, the, the more beneficial it was at the networks with bigger and complex, uh, bigger network size and complex networks. So this was exactly what we wanted to find that uh, incorporating algorithms is beneficial, especially when the ne network becomes complex and bigger. And having established the validity of our method at the simulation level, we moved on to the empirical level. And this is the group level effectivity connectivity metrics using the or at the glass or at atlas. And we can, we can see that uh, there is this very strong intermodal connectivity and uh, strong homotopy connectivity. And then I calculated the efferent and efferent strength of each parcel at the upper brain level. And then it is interesting to see that 
that there is this asymmetrical pattern of efferent and efferent strength at the parcellation level. And uh, specifically, the uh, PFM complex, or otherwise known as TPJ, and the other two unimodal sensory areas were start, or they had a strong efferent strength. And the uh, PPCC and MT, these associative cortical areas, had a very strong effort and strength. To see the more detailed picture, we did a seed based uh, connectivity uh, analysis, and we found that these unimodal sensory areas had a very proximal connections in a hierarchical manner, meaning that, for example, this V1 area uh, was connected to these proximal, hierarchically proximal areas with positive connections and hierarchically distal areas with negative connections. And the same pattern was observed in the primary motor area, but the area of PFM, which, uh, or the TPJ, was showing very widely connected uh, pattern. And I think this is, uh, uh, this is something, this, is, this has something to do with this uh, principal gradient. And I think this is an inter interesting observation. And also to see whether this kind of pattern was actually there within a network analysis study. And we found that uh, TPJ was having, TPJ showed a very strong between the centrality and the other areas or not. Uh, and we plotted this using this network plot and categorized or, and then uh, categorized these uh, 360 parcels using these 22 submodules of Glassar Atlas. And we found that this, uh, edges or these polars of this network plot were located by unimodal areas and they're, they are connected by these transmodal areas. And this is it. And thank you for listening. Do you have any quick questions? I have one. Yeah. Um, I was wondering in any of your models, do you incorporate structural connectivity as well? No. So they're all, um, yeah, ambivalent to, to structural connectivity. Yeah, yeah. But then it would be interesting to see, I guess, like whether the patterns you see this, this measures between the centralities related to the um, structural connectivity as well. Yeah. Thank next, you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the next one we have is Stuart. Thank you, Rick Stewart. Okay, so again, thank you for the opportunity to present some of the work we have been doing in the balance. So, widespread connectivity of the balance facilitates whole brain dynamics. To understand these dynamics, we need to understand climate cortical organization. Previous work has to try to achieve this by focusing on flowing nuclei, yet the principles underlying the cortical patterning of flowing projections remains unclear. However, a recent study in the mouse found that and uh, flat nuclei form a hierarchy arranged along a medial lateral axis of gene expression. Notably, position on this axis was associated with differences in cortical projections, suggesting it represents an underlying principle of thalamic organization. So we therefore wanted to receive whether the results in this mouse model would extend to the human model as well, <laughs> as this would provide further evidence of this principle. So to do so, we first defined a set of seeds throughout the thalamic volume. Then using data from the Allen Human Brain Atlas, we match gene expression to each of these seeds, thereby constructing a seed by gene expression matrix. Additionally, from each seed, we also perform probabilistic cladography to 250 regions in the left hemisphere. And by repeating this for all seeds across all regions, we construct a matrix of seed by cortical connectivity values. We can then combine this matrix with our gene expression matrix we defined earlier, and we can extract gradients from these by using everyone's favorite gradient extraction technique, which is, of course, principal component analysis. <laughs> so with principal component analysis, this gives us two matrices, one of principal component scores, which tells us how strongly each seed uh, relates to the underlying component, and one of loadings, which tells us how much each uh, cortical region and gene contributed to each component. And we can use these to ask, is there a dominant medial lateral gradient present in the human thalamus? And furthermore, what kind of cortical projections emerge from the such gradient? So returning to our matrices for a second, using our score matrix, 
we want to only extract the, uh, the first primary component, which in our case explains 30% of the variance. And when we project these scores onto the thalamus, or onto the seas and the surrounding voxels, we see a medial lateral gradient emerge. Mm -hmm. So next we want to know, is this gradient similar to what was observed in the mouse? And to do so, we can see if similar genes in the mouse and human are associated with this axis. And to do so, we can use the loadings for the genes. So firstly, we, and we do an enrichment ratio. So what we do is we find the genes that have the largest positive correlation with this axis and find that they are enriched for genes in the mouse that have the largest correlation with this axis. Conversely, when we look at the, those that have a negative relationship, we do see an enrichment, although it doesn't quite achieve significance. But overall, these results suggest that similar genes define the axis in both the mouse and the humans, suggesting conservation across species. Finally, we can use the first principle component loadings for um, cortical regions to see how which areas are associated with connections along this gradient. So when we project these onto the cortex, we see that our medial lateral thalamic gradient maps to an anterior posterior cortical one. And furthermore, previous researchers suggested that intrinsic timescales were associated with cortical, um, thalamocortical projections. And indeed, when we compare these values to our, our gradient, we find that they are strongly correlated at about a 0.8 level. It's also interesting to note that these two, these gradients, both in the thalamus and the cortex, correspond to fundamental axes of neurogenesis, suggesting that the features of this gradient may be a result of this early development. So, in summary, we find that a principal axis of transcriptomic and structural connectivity in the human thalamus recurs along the medial level gradient. This is potentially conserved across species. It's associated with distinct cortical patterning and cortical function, and may also reflect sequential function. And just a quick word of thanks to those who gave me assistance with this project and provide all the freely available data and to all of you for listening. <laughs>
and computational neuroscience, but we also have like people from the field of linguistics or aesthetics, uh, for example. And um, it is a fully financed program through the Max Planck Society and the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Um, so if you do have questions about it, feel free to approach me or take a flyer, or you can also approach Jacques over here, who's also in the program. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot. Perfect. Okay. Um, we're going to start our final session of the day now. It's on cognition and clinical perspectives. And Michael, you actually have that speaker. Oh, <laughs> <that's okay. laughs> okay, let me just open up the presentation. Yeah, we're back. It's going. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said, I've been like very much. I actually did one of my rotations, and um, it's also my first PhD project for the PAL. So I was very honored when I was invited to already present my um, work to you and discuss it a bit after. So the project I'm presenting is uh, coordinated cognitive sickness alterations across mental disorders, which is a transdiagnostic enigma study. So to me, one fundamental question in understanding the brain based of psychiatric disorders is always to which degree the patterns we see are actually disorder specific or rather transdiagnostics related to a general uh, vulnerability for mental illness. And of course, these two should be seen as about complementary approaches. I think we are here taking the approach of cross disorder similarities. Because um, I'm very interested in the fact that there are actually quite a lot of overlapping risk factors among psychiatric diagnoses, like shared genetic risk factors, very prominently between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, for example. Sorry, just to know this <laughs> <laughs> um, but next to shared genetic risk factors, there's also rather. There's also shared environmental risk factors like early life stress and trauma, which are not super predictive of certain things to diagnosis. And these overlapping risk factors may be one reason for the overlap to also observe um, in neuroimaging phenotypes, like in uh, meta analyses showing experimental volume reductions primarily in the salience network, but also in previous enigma studies where they spatially correlate to this impact map and see quite some spatial correlations to between disorders. So it is another question, what is it that drives these patterns which are shared and quite shared between disorders? And one prominent explanation is uh, underlying network organization. So regional disease effects are usually not isolated, but rather interrelated across the cortex. But we still don't know if transdiagnostic effects are also embedded in a shared cooperation uh, network across the cortex. And this is what we wanted to investigate here. And it does become increasingly possible to do this in large samples uh, through open data initiatives, uh, like the Enigma Consortium that collect samples, um, like clinical and fossil samples across the globe. So for our project, we access Cohen C maps and cortical sickness uh, case control differences from 12,000 patients and roughly 19,000 controls through the Enigma toolbox. And um, we included six disorders here, bipolar disorder, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, major depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, and schizophrenia. And through the toolbox, uh, toolbox, we also access functional and structural connectivity data on healthy controls from the Human Connectome Project. So with the aim to find systematic patterns across disorder illness effects, we generated a co-alteration matrix. So this co-alteration matrix could be seen as a covariance of cross disorder illness effect matrix, or mathematically speaking, a correlation of C values between regions and across disorders. And then identifies co-alteration paths by taking the sum of the strongest connections. So this Parts that we see primarily in the lingual, medial, temporal, and medial prefrontal gyrus 
are regions where disease impact is most strongly coordinated between disorders and across the cortex. And they are actually not randomly organized across the cortex, but they do follow or they do correlate with functional network hubs. We also did some follow up analysis to understand better what they reflect, and we do see that they are indeed, uh, where they mainly overlap with regions that are affected across disorders. So it is a covariance of disease impact and not so much a covariance of retainment or unaffected regions. And they also mainly overlap with a cortical sickness decreases across um, conditions rather than increases. So we next aim to see whether there are some structures that are suspiciously strongly connected to these hubs and may therefore um, influence the cortical patterns we observe. So we use c place connectivity profiles from the Human Connector Project to healthy controls and systematically correlated that with our co-alteration hub map and corrected for spatial autocorrelation using spin tests. And so regions that are strongly connected to alteration hubs were regions that we identified as potential disease epicenters. And what you see here in the common frontal regions or half circle. And so we observed most prominent epicenters in ventrolateral prefrontal and medial temporal regions. And there is quite a strong overlap between structural and functional epicenters, which is reasonable, I would think. Um, but we also see that functional epicenters emerge above and beyond structural ones, which is probably related to how functional connectivity is computed and uh, given that it also includes rather widespread and fully synaptic networks that um, go beyond hardwired tracks. So the first chapter of our analysis um, embeds regional alterations within cortex-wise transdiagnostic covariance networks. And the fact that co-alteration hubs followed patterns of normative connectivity hubs indicates some role of nodal stress in shaping these patterns. So regions that are highly interconnected and um, thus highly active in many different subnetworks and also highly metabolically active are known to be more vulnerable to pathology, but also um, differently affected by aging. Um, so that is the likely explanation for the pattern we observed here. And regarding the epicenters, we observed these mainly in heteromodal cortices, so regions that have rather long range connections with the personal cortex, which facilitates their contribution to this cortex wide pattern. And also in regions like the prefrontal cortex, for example, that showed rather protracted plasticity during your development, so larger. Um, window for potential neurodevelopmental aberrations, um, which we are interested here because most of the disorders we include do have quite a strong neurodevelopmental component. So that's something to rather look into in the future. In a second chapter of our analysis, we aim to identify organizational axes along which these cooperation networks may be um, organized. And I guess I don't need to explain <laughs> to this audience what a gradient is, but maybe what it reflects in this context. So our transdiagnostic gradients differentiate regions with maximally distinct transdiagnostic covariance profiles. So the principal gradient reflects maximally distinct transdiagnostic covariance uh, profiles in prefrontal compared to temporal regions, whereas the secondary gradient reflects uh, a different pathological network embedding in regions holding primary sensory and limited regions compared to rather heterocyclical variety of regions. We then did some decoding steps to understand further what these axes reflect on the neurobiological level. And going a bit from broad to detailed, um, we thought, okay, we know from previous studies that regions with high cortical sickness structural covariance are usually regions with increased susceptibility to pathological impact. So we investigated that transdiagnostic alteration networks are organized along similar axes as normative cortical sickness covariance and found that at least the principal gradient was. Um, so the organizational pattern of pathological changes in cortical sickness are similar to that of absolute cortical sickness per se, or the, the two axes that guide both patterns. Um, we next went into more fine-grained um, direction looking at regional social architecture. So we segregated our Transdiagnostic gradients um, along five central architectonic classes, as defined by Ponikonomo and Koskinas. And we observed that the principal gradients 
um, mainly segregated agranular versus um, granular regions. So that means it segregates thick cortex with large cells from thin cortex with many but small cells. Cannot see my mouse. Okay, so it's the one and the five. <laughs> um, so basically, regions with highly different cytoarchitecture are also embedded very differently in this transdiagnostic cooperation network. And the second gradient segregated granular from parietal cytoarchitectonic classes. So generally, we could say that regions with shared cytoarchitecture are more likely embedded similarly in these transdiagnostic cooperation patterns. Lastly, we also performed a task-based functional meta-analytic decoding using the Neurosense database to see which functional networks are um, captured along both gradients. So to do that, we merge both gradients, which is what you see in the colorful brain in the middle. And the colors on the brain are also reflected in the colors of the parcels and their position along the two gradients in the 2G space. So here we observe um, that co-alteration is very distinct in, do I have a laser bar here actually? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, very distinct in unimodal basic sensory regions compared uh, to more attention perception related networks compared to higher level cognitive um, task based activation. So basically, the complexity or the, the level of cognitive processing is linked to uh, where, uh, it's, where the network is embedded in this co alteration space. So together, our say to architectonic and functional decoding and size of susceptibility networks do link to structure and function in a way. So one interesting aspect is that at least the principal gradient follows the normative cortical sickness gradient. And we know that cortical sickness covariance to a certain degree reflects shared maturational trajectories that is driven by shared genetic factors. And it could be that regions that mature together are also vulnerable together across disorders so that the spatial gradient that we describe here is also a bit reflective of the spatial temporal gradient. But it is, um, again, looking at new development, something we want to further investigate. Um, we can also say that regions with similar site to architecture are more likely embedded um, similarly within this network. And this may be due to local computational strategies, uh, local wiring, or also the degree of plasticity associated with different coding formulas. This. And we also know that regions with similar microstructural layering profile are more likely connected. So there could be a sort of structural scaffold um, guiding the cooperation network we observe. And then lastly, in line with the cytoarchitectonic decoding, also the functional decoding showed us that regions involved in uh, similar tasks and involved in similar types of processing are. Um, then with shared sensitivity, it seems. There are some limitations I would also like to address at this point. Um, one being that the Enigma samples we included, they were all adult samples, which we decided to do because um, we didn't want to have any big impacts of age differences or developmental stage differences in there, and the maps were also age corrected. But of course, the different disorders we included do have um, different mean ages of onset. So there is likely an offset in um, disease and medication history here. Also, there is always some within disorder heterogeneity, which we did not account for in this transdiagnostic approach that is based on summary statistics. And Enigma data is traditionally shared in Dizik and Kiliani space. So we are left with rather sparse data points and don't have another um, parcellation that we could use to replicate our results. But overall, by investigating the embedding of regional vulnerability um, in a transdiagnostic context, we observed that cortical alterations do seem to be coordinated across the cortex and across disorders along connectomic, cytoarchitectonic, and functional dimensions. I would like to thank, first of all, you for your attention, um, but especially also my supervisor, Sophie Falk, who cannot be here today, um, and the whole cognitive neurogenetics group at the Research Center Jülich, and the MPI working with cognitive and brain sciences, and all the Nigma working groups involved and collaborators. Thank you.
Because you're having that's ooh, that was a quick one. Um, so that was an amazing talk, and if that was your presentation project, I can't wait to see like your whole thesis. Um, my question is, if I remember correctly, you're seeing that many different disorders sort of converge in having alterations of cortical thickness in heteromodal association cortices. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how you think about the fact that we're seeing similar areas with like structural alterations in these disorders, but yeah, it produces this really like divergence with so many different symptom patterns. Oh, uh, yeah. So, Interesting question. <laughs> and actually, we did try to do also some disorder specific analysis based on these to um, look at within disorder variants and how it is actually reflected in the trans diagnostic pattern we see. And um, even though it is a general pattern that most disorders show mainly intramural effects rather than multiple regional effects, um, it is indeed the case that some regions show high. Similarity with our transdiagnostic covariance profile only in prefrontal regions or only in unimodal regions. So I would not say that this shared transdiagnostic pattern is uh, the only thing that drives the uh, uh, disorder specific patterns we still see, because if you look at how uh, it's not just open up anymore, but actually the cortical sickness patterns are, of course, different between disorders. We are only kind of boiling it down to what is shared, but there are still also many differences, which is why I always say it is complementary to disorder-specific research. Um, and it's probably more reflective of shared symptoms, but not so much disorder-specific symptoms. Right. That makes sense. <laughs> That's cool. Thank you so much, Anka. Okay, next up we have Jessica Boya from the MNI to come give us a talk about microstructural gradients and epilepsy. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'd like first to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work today. So today I'll be talking about uh, microstructural gradient changes in temporal epilepsy. So first to give a little bit of background. So temporal epilepsy um, is the most prevalent type of drug resistant, uh, focal drug resistant epilepsy in adults. And um, is often characterized by changes in brain microstructure. And these are temporal structures are particularly affected in this condition, as the disease related microstructural damage is often visible in uh, histological examinations of surgical specimens, uh, really manifesting as the campus neurosis. But these microstructural changes can also be observed in different MRI sequences. Um, which has really also opened the way to investigations of structural function and interactions with these patients. And in fact, temporal epilepsy has really emerged as this unique disease model to study the structural substrates of that cellular memory. So we know that TLD patients often present with cognitive impairment, uh, which can affect multiple or specific cognitive domains, but episodic memory is often affected. And these deficits uh, in memory have been repeatedly associated with typical organization of memory circuits involving the hippocampus, but also with the degree of hippocampal damage uh, indexed by regional volume reductions. But uh, advances in structural imaging have also revealed these more widespread patterns of microstructural anomalies in TLE and have notably emphasized that microstructural um, changes are not confined to uh, the, uh, the affected temporal lobe or the temporal lobe giving rise to the patient's seizures. So, for instance, in this study using quantitative T1 imaging, which is a sequence thought to be sensitive to intracortical myelo architecture, uh, TLA patients show significant signal alterations uh, in the mesial temporal lobe, ipsilateral to the seizure focus. But these changes also extended to motor lateral temporal as well as orbital frontal cortices. And when we look at more superficial cortical depth, so in the top part of this figure here, uh, signal changes were. Also observed in the more frontal, parietal, but also occipital regions, um, which really highlights this rather distributed disease substrate of TLE. So it's with studies like these, but also many others that have looked at other structural markers like cortical thickness, for example, have really supported this view of TLE as a more kind of macro scale system level disorder uh, in which uh, more temporal than big disease epistemic and maybe at the root of more widespread uh, structural changes in these patients. Uh, but however, the potential link between 
memory function uh, and these more distributed patterns of microstructural damage uh, in TLE is still a bit unclear. And this more macro scale organization of cortical microstructure has already been investigated um, in healthy populations, but also in animal studies, it has been shown to follow this rather distinct, but also quite reproducible pattern. So this gradient of uh, cortical microstructure uh, really distinguishes regions of the cortex according to the similarity of their intracortical microstructural characteristics with here we see the usual gradients uh, in the case of work in plus biology where similar colors uh, in both plots at the top represent regions of the cortex with similar microstructural properties. But beyond just tracking variations in cortical microstructure, um, this gradient has also been shown to follow patterns of cortical connectivity, but also regional vulnerability to disease effects, but also transitions in more unimodal to transport cognitive processing, which really places it as this important neurobiological axis of brain organization. But also with this approach, we can now perform subject-specific assessments of cortical microstructure that are not limited to local regions, but that can also inform us on the regions more kind of large-scale embedding within the broader microstructural landscape of cortex. So what we wanted to do with this study was to kind of see how this uh, microstructural gradient uh, might be affected in TLE and how alterations in this gradient might relate to uh, memory function, uh, looking at organization of memory circuits as well as uh, memory performance. So we studied a cohort of 21 patients with temporal epilepsy scan that are center and a red line 235 uh, agents X match of the controls, uh, who all undermined the multimodal energy protocol, uh, field strength of three Tesla, where participants completed T1 weighted scans for uh, surface communication, as well as quantitative T1 imaging which was used for um, quantitative profiling of intracortical minor architecture, and also completed a uh, functional MRI uh, task, specifically targeting episodic memory. So in order to derive these subject-specific microstructural gradients, uh, so we first construct these vertex-wise intensity profiles that sample quantitative T1 image intensities that uh, within the cortex, uh, from the peel to the white matter boundary uh, in the direction of cortical columns. So we can see, um, looking at the uh, bottom left plot here, that we have this profile sample in V1 and U, and we enter simulate. So we can see that these profiles across these two regions are quite different. So they're not only shifted in terms of their mean intensity, but they also show kind of different overall shapes, which is consistent with what we know from histology, for instance, that these two regions show drastically different uh, laminar organization. So we then um, can take these vertex-wise intensity profiles and cross-correlate across all vertices of the cortex, which results in these subject-specific microstructural similarity matrices that represent the microstructural similarity of each vertex to every vertex along the world sheet. And so I'll just specify that all of this pre-processing up to the generation of these microstructural similarity matrices was um, uh, completed with MECAPEC, which is a an openly available processing pipeline that uh, we recently developed and, and released. Um, and we then used the brain space toolbox to use eigenvectors or, or gradients of, micro, of critical microstructure each TLD and healthy participants. And they were also all aligned to a common template uh, using the progressive point. So looking at the first gradient of cortical microstructure, um, the top right figure for both groups, the French calls a similar pattern in most TLD and healthy participants uh, by differentiating these more primary and uh, unimodal sensory and motor regions from paralympic and intermodal cortices. But also, we kind of see this overall typical uh, similar pattern in, in both groups when we plot the histogram of graded values for the, the average gradient across both groups. Um, we see TLD in orange and healthy controls in gray. There seems to be this kind of contraction of the microstructural gradient in TLE, which is particularly prominent in the, um, in the paralympic anchor of the microstructural gradients more in these uh, higher values. And we can confirm this difference using uh, surface based linear models that were implemented in the brain stack toolbox, uh, where we compare these gradient scores between TLE and healthy participants. And with this analysis, we could find these significant clusters of gradient reductions. Uh, in TLE that are outlined in, uh, in white in the bottom figure. So we see this significant contraction of the microstructural gradient in these 
temporal polar as well as lateral prefrontal regions, uh, it's lateral to posterior locus. So overall, these findings suggest the rather widespread loss of microstructural differentiation in TLE relative to controls, with however much more prominent effects seen in temporal and prefrontal regions that it's lateral to posterior focus. So in other words, there seems to be this kind of increased uh, integration of microstructural patterns uh, across the cortex in TLE, but particularly affecting more temporal and mid regions. So next, we wanted to assess the specificity of these effects to TLE, and for this, we turn to transcriptomics. So for this analysis, we cross-reference findings from the recent epilepsy GMOS study um, and with cortical gene expression data from the um, human brain animals. And we use the fully pre-processed data for this analysis that's aggregated in the Enigma toolbox, which we talked about in the previous talk as well. And we could then uh, obtain with this data um, average gene expression maps that are associated with different epilepsy syndromes. And after controlling for the shared spatial autocorrelation between both features, um, we found that the microstructural reorganizations that I showed earlier were significantly correlated with the average expression patterns of genes that are associated with hippocampal sclerosis. But the correlations with other epilepsy syndromes was significant, suggesting that there is some level of specificity of identified uh, changes in microstructural differentiation to TLE related genetic processes. So, as part of this study, our participants also completed an episodic memory task uh, inside the MRI scanner, uh, which allowed us to explore how microstructural gradient changes might relate to episodic memory network reorganizations, but also recall performance. So this task had two phases, with first an encoding task, a uh, encoding phase, where participants had to memorize um, different image pairs. There's 56 unique image pairs, and half of them were presented twice. And after about a 12-minute delay, participants completed the retrieval phase. Um, that followed a three alternative force choice design where participants needed to select out of the three images at the bottom of the screen, which one was originally paired with the image at the top. So we first looked at functional connectivity during the um, encoding phase of the task, uh, targeting regions that uh, show significant microstructural gradient contractions as seeds in this analysis, uh, which are indicated by the black markers in the top two figures. So this allowed us to kind of explore how these regions with um, atypical embedding within the microstructural gradient space were interacting with other air regions of the brain uh, during the memory encoding. And we found that both polar and prefrontal states showed this distributed pattern of connectivity reductions, mostly covering more limbic and default mode regions. Uh, but we also saw the significant um, connectivity reductions associated with each C that are outlined uh, in white. And we could also find that recall performance was significantly correlated with the magnitude of gradient reductions um, in the temporal regions. It's in the bottom left figure, but these correlations with um, microstructural gradient changes in prefrontal regions are not correlated with uh, recall performance in this task, indicating some behavioral specificity of uh, the microstructural changes that we had identified with, uh, with our gradient research. So just to quickly wrap up, we found that uh, TLE patients present um, atypical uh, cortical microstructural organization that extends beyond the mesial temporal epicenter towards or uh, lateral temporal, temporal polar, and lateral prefrontal regions. And the overall topography of these gradient changes were uh, relatively specific to TLE, or at least TLE related genetic processes, or compared, at least in this analysis, to the gene expression patterns uh, that we saw in other epilepsy syndromes. And we also demonstrate that regions with these uh, significantly altered. Microstructural differentiation patterns um, show reduced functional connectivity during memory encoding, and other magnitude of these reductions in the temporal lobe were associated with task performance. So, overall, these findings uh, offer a microstructural framework to uh, better understand functional network uh, reorganizations, but also cognitive dysfunction in, in TLE, <coughs> while also supporting the view of TLE as a more macro scale system model. 
So with that, I'd like to uh, thank all my fellow lab members, of both labs with which I'm affiliated, our collaborators, and also highlight the contribution of several open source tools and resources that in making this work possible. So I'll uh, encourage you to check this out. And again, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this today. Um, okay, do we have any questions? Otherwise, I, I have a question. I noticed so you have, <laughs> I know the project a little bit, but um, I noticed in one part that you have this like shrinking of the, the gradients because paralympic areas seem to move in a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you have a, a hypothesis or speculate on what's changing in the tissue microstructure that could make them more similar to these intermediary areas? Right, so we have this um, other analysis that I didn't present today, um, but we also looked at like movements and how things change uh, just across the different regions. And, but the, the type of change that we see in the moments, especially in spirits, is really close to what we find in the grade, which I guess is kind of expected exactly yeah. like, because like the correlation patterns for the context, I think it's probably most related to the screeners and the overall shape yeah. of the profile that's captured by screeners. So some layer specific changes that make the screeners more like an injury area, right. or at least makes it in some way more similar to these primary yeah. unimodal regions that kind of seems to discretion. Yeah. But there also seems to be, at least in temporal regions, a like reduction in uh, standard deviation. So I think the profile just becomes like a bit wider, less differentiation. Yeah, okay. Great. Thank you so much, Jess. Okay, and the last presentation of the day, I can't believe we're here already. I'm a little bit sad to do the call. Is from Chris. Do you want to come down, Chris? I'll write on the presentation. Okay. And finally, we have Chris Tillman from um, Imperial College London. All right. Um, thanks uh, for allowing me to present some results uh, on psychedelic and psychedelic research and its influence on the principal gradient of uh, brain organization. It's a bit of a different talk, I guess, but uh, hopefully meaningful. Maybe also in, in terms of how. Uh, we can interpret some of the functional sort of implications of uh, gradients. Um, <clears throat> so, BMT is a psychedelic drug, and more specifically, it's a classic serotonergic psychedelic drug uh, whose um, main mechanism of action at the molecular level is concerns at least its 5 c 2 a receptor, serotonin 2 a receptor. So, we know from uh, work with rodents uh, and, and some uh, actually uh, uh, clinical studies with human beings as well, that if we block the receptor, we block uh, the main psychological or the main sort of psychedelic action. Uh, and this is in some quite a few studies, again, uh, clinical studies with behavioral models and human studies. Um, and when we look at the, the distribution of this 5 hc 2 a receptor, which is actually widely expressed in the cortex, uh, it becomes um, uh, quite relevant uh, understanding, or at least thinking about how do we perturb this uh, system and how that translates to the, you know, the meaningful effects of psychedelics in cognition and experience, um, and how they are widely distributed in the brain, more specifically, uh, it seems in high evolved uh, brain regions. Now, different psychedelics have uh, different um, temporal window of action. Uh, most of them lasting hours. Uh, however, in the case of DMT, uh, we have the opportunity to induce a perturbation when smoked or injected that is short lasting, therefore, providing a, an opportunity for us to image a perturbation and how it might impact cognition and brain function. And here you can see actually the the specific similarities in the DMT molecule and the serotonin molecule, uh, somehow uh, you know, providing this, this idea that DMT and psychedelics uh, hijack a specific endogenous system that is very much related to serotonin. Now, when we think about where are these psychological effects uh, and, and the relevance 
Uh, in the case of DMT, particularly pronounced effects revolve uh, in visual imagery, such as elementary imaging, which is visualizing geometries and so on, and complex imagery. So images that have some form of semantic sort of meaning attached to it, while uh, a state of strong sense of disembodiment occurs. Uh, experientially, people feel uh, that they are no longer present in the surrounding environments, but instead uh, they are now inhabiting what feels like some form of alternate dimension or reality in which they interact uh, with uh, beings, entities, and so on. So a very kind of far out experience in high doses. Uh, what's meaningful from a more functional perspective is the idea that people have a strong sense of immersion while they're no longer interacting with the surrounding environment, very much like the experience of dreaming. Because some people actually think about uh, these immersive psychedelic states as potentially a model for dreaming, or if you will, the possibility for us to engage uh, with some form of endogenously driven virtual system detached from our environments. So this is a, a kind of like nice um, reproduction of what are these effects. Uh, vivid visual imagery when people have their eyes closed. And at the same time, uh, where it's usually not captured very well by questionnaires, the strong feeling of certainty people have that what they're experiencing feels very fundamentally real. And we'll look for why that might be relevant. Now, in our previous studies, we found out this EEG that these, uh, these effects relate to a strong uh, perturbation to alpha band, uh, at least the EEG. So broadly, all, the, all, all around the scalp, we see these massive ductions of alpha and these increases in delta waves, and they match the intensity of the experience quite well. Uh, so these alpha band reductions have been reproduced uh, in a lot of EEG studies with psychedelics, but these delta uh, increases are really somewhat specific to the immersive, immersive quality of the experience, somehow proposing this alternative view of this function of delta waves, no longer about this idea of unconsciousness as usually thought of, but more of a, a sense of conscious disconnection from the environment. Again, the idea of a differentiation from surrounding context and instead an immersive experience that are driven endogenously. Now, I'll present now some of uh, the latest findings, which we did an FMRI uh, study involving, again, uh, intravenous administrations of DMT. So we had an eight-minute baseline scan, 20 participants in the scanner, and we administered uh, DMT uh, intravenously again. Uh, for 20 minutes, we did some of the whole duration of the scan, and using classic uh, like traditional canonical uh, adverse state analysis, we found an overall reduction in limb uh, integrity high, uh, in both high order and low order uh, resting state networks, uh, while at the same time increased global connectivity uh, of harder networks. So that this measure of global connectivity is essentially the average connectivity of each parcel of the brain to the rest of the brain, and then we average all these parcels according to their, net, uh, to their networks. And that's how we got these scores. At the same time, we found increased connectivity between higher networks and the rest of the brain, uh, and decreased connectivity between low-level networks. Uh, when we looked at these global connectivity patterns at the parcelation level, um, we found that these effects over time, we're particularly mapping very strongly with these, again, high level networks, like the VMN, frontoparietal, salience, and also potential networks. And also, we found expected correlations, as it was an EGFMRI study simultaneously, between these increases in delta power and global functional connectivity decreases in alpha and global functional connectivity and the measure of entropy that we measured uh, with the EEG as well. Now, when it comes to gradient, uh, so this ana analysis was performed by Manish Kiran, who also has a poster, which I recommend uh, that you check out, with also other psychedelics. Um, in the placebo condition, we found um, the expected gradient uh, organization of the placebo gradient. Whereas with DMT, we found a significant flattening of that gradient. So 
low level uh, regions or sensory regions, um, the gradient score increasing towards the transmodal pole, whereas transmodal regions showing the opposite effect. So a reduced gradient score in the sensory areas. And at the network level, that is exactly what we found. So strong reduction or flattening of this uh, principal gradient of brain organization, which can also be seen here. Now, in terms of how this relates to cognition or experience, or the experiential effects, uh, we did some explorative analysis with all the different measures that we took uh, with our multi-model uh, paradigms. Intriguingly, we found that the gradients were actually um, in this explorative analysis, the ones that were showing the best correlations with some of our psychometric questionnaires. Now, intriguingly, uh, we found that they were particularly pronounced on these high-level, high-order mystical uh, type effects. So some of these mystical type effects have something to do with uh, stuff, uh, for example, corresponding to the transcendence of time and space or the ineffability of experience. Uh, the experience, again, having a certainty uh, quality to it as. And somehow, um, a way to interpret it, I feel that it might be relevant here, is uh, uh, the idea that the principle of gradient of brain organization somehow, how it relates to consciousness, uh, might have something to do with this sort of general structuring of experience. So this mystical type experiences uh, somehow relating to the way that we engage with, with the world, our assumptions in the way that the world is organized, and how a disruption of that organization with something like DMT uh, may be relating to these sort of effects. Wasn't the accounting also, um, this is of course kind of like a speculative stretch, uh, to some of the effects that we've seen in the long term as the psychological one of how these uh, metaphysical like experiences that people have with these substances uh, may translate in long term belief change about how people uh, change their worldviews following a psychedelic experience. So, for example, we found uh, that following a single psychedelic experience, large surveys, uh, we see an effect in how people tend to endorse less strongly the idea that the fundamental nature of reality is physical, for example. Or they tend to endorse a bit more the idea of determinism as opposed to free will. And somehow, uh, I think in, in a way, the idea if we, if we consider the possibility that somehow this alteration to, uh, to cognition or experience induced by something like BMT and its mechanism, when we look at it at this sort of principle rate of a brain organization, can maybe somewhat, somehow explain the possibility of how these substances, and specifically BMT, in its ritual use in the form of ayahuasca, might be somehow related to the developments uh, and maintenance of specific cosmologies, ways of seeing how the world and reality operates, which is consistent with the natural logical literature of the ritual use of ayahuasca, but also one would speculate more recent uh, ways of perceiving the culture, like. Uh, the influence of psychedelics in the countercultural movements in the 1960s. So when one thinks as well with this idea of compressing uh, you know, the gradient or perturbing the gradient in that significant fashion and uh, consistent findings with schizophrenia, for example, and how the structuring of experience is also altered in somewhat of a resonant way with the psychedelic experience. Uh, you know, there might be sort of relevant resonances there. Um, also, the recent talk on the temporal low epilepsy uh, may be somewhat relevant in that regard, kind of like a similar flattening of the gradient, although in this case, a microstructural organization. So, when we uh, look also at the similarities between our findings, um, at least using some reverse inference, for instance, using Mirosem. Um, the 5 ht 2 a receptor maps uh, that we can find uh, using pet images. 
in the first grading, we also find some uh, form of resonance, uh, and these could be first um, non anatomical terms used in yours, mostly related to language and semantic condition, uh, semantic mission, and so on. So this, uh, I think, also poses the possibility of redefining really ways in which we can perturb this 5 t 2 a receptor system uh, via the use of psychedelics. Uh, when we look at, uh, again, the expression of the 5 t 2 a receptor system and uh, significant correlations uh, with high level systems in the brain, like all the network, uh, the external cortex and the association cortex and the spatial overlaps uh, with the archetypal axis, the evolutionary expansion, and a recently proposed synergy redundancy gradients of information processing. And of course, as well, the current overlap with the principal gradient of brain organization. So possibly hinting towards the possibility um, that this by the C2A receptor system that we can investigate with the use of psychedelic drugs might inform us of some fundamental way in which conscious experiences uh, help us to structure and navigate the uh, world. So thanks for your attention. Do we have any quick questions for Chris? Is, oh, that's one. And the other speakers um, can come. In I watched that they have the uh, regional findings that very consistent across West American regions. It was studied and worked out with Alvin Luna and Pablo Madrid. So, do you have the same, the similar findings in DMT and in your form? Uh, yeah, so I, I know of a lot of Luna. I didn't know about his specific, you know, what he proposes is common sort of visionary phenomena across the regions. But at, the, at a broad level, uh, what seems to be quite consistent in terms of the experiences we have, one is this experience of geometrical patterns that seems to be cross-cultural. And the other is that both Western individuals and indigenous communities, uh, when they experience DMT, they experience also these feelings of immersion into different realities and communication with beings or entities, which is something that we're trying to figure out how it works in terms of brain activity. I'm going to ask you to head over to the bench and we can continue questions, but I'm also welcoming Beth Jeffries up to the podium. She's going to help with a discussion panel. Um, so, Beth, do you want to take over? Fantastic. Any questions for uh, three speakers? Yes. So, I have a question about blocking. Um, in neurological disorders, where the character characterized by psychosis, they say, is finding that they usually um, see in PET scans, which is called the singular island scan. It's basically the visual areas of the epithelium, the more singular anterior singular areas of the epithelium, we have an island of um, increased epithelium. And I was wondering if you found something similar, which, which probably the course of networks you wouldn't would reveal. Yeah. Um... No, unfortunately, I mean, that would be amazing if we could find like an island of activation specific to something like this, but we haven't uh, gotten to that degree of specificity at all, I would say, psychedelics. Okay. I'll say the question during the last talk. Have you thought about incorporating your results in terms of this integrated information theory? Uh, yeah, so in the, in the last slide I presented, um, we, uh, this, this apparent overlap with this uh, recently proposed uh, information synergy versus redundant uh, gradients. It's a nature neuroscience paper by Andrea Lupi. And in that paper, they actually found that also within these higher order areas, um, you know, they kind of operationalize integrated information um, according to the equations that have been proposed by the Tononi group. And they find that in, indeed in these uh, and these brain systems that are, appear to be more closely related to, you know, the perturbation by psychedelics, uh, you know, bias type. Um, but this is an indirect sort of effect. We still have to do the analysis. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
cambio. So you were showing that um, people who had BMD with effects serotonin signaling have increased global brain connectivity and flattening of principal gradient. And then earlier we heard about how like signal travels along the principal gradient and potentially information, and that is also maybe related to neural modulation. So have you thought about at all like linking the earlier talk we heard on QPPs to neural results between the principal gradient? Like do you think you can be because like activity or information flow along the gradient is changed by DMP? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, seems very relevant. Uh, actually, we're speaking about that with Manesh. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the specifics of it uh, are, but does make uh, a lot of sense in terms of you know the relevance of this higher region of fraction and how they sensory effects of that. and the flattening of the you know the not significant flattening something to do with. Some sort of sort of the same in terms of information processing between both extreme poles. Mike, did you have a question? I think it's actually like super similar to your question. I was just wondering because you did have some behavioral or questionnaire based data in there at some point, right? Yeah. Um, is it actually possible to collect that while the subjects are in the scanner? So you can use changes in gradient segregation to changes in sensation somehow. Uh, so we we approximately to that. The, the issue with that is that when we give these high doses, um, people are actually you know detached the environments. So it's a bit hard to really program, and also metacognitive capabilities kind of go down. Uh, nonetheless, um, we take we do intensive gradients over time in the scanner. So we have a second scanner which we do this, and after that we introduce. And uh, what we're doing now is that we're applying both qualitative analysis on those interviews, trying to code them, but at the same time, uh, natural language processing of the data. And then, based on that, we'd like to now. I mean, again, we're finished about this maybe with uh, HMMs, uh, you know, whatever is dynamically relevant uh, over time, because the experience changes a lot. Of time. And we're interested in that kind of variability. Cool, yeah, very interesting. <laughs> so, um, I have a, a quick question. It's actually inspired by your talk, but perhaps it's relevant to all three. Um, because I think I, I noticed when you were presenting your slides that there was a hemispheric difference. There was a, a left lateral, there were more left lateral regions that were had more trans uh, diagnostic and the copies. Is that, is that true? Is that something that you can comment Yeah, it, it's something definitely you don't observe across all disorders, but in some, like in schizophrenia, for example. And that's, I guess, why it's also reflected in the transdiagnostic uh, results. Because in the end, I mean, it's not just mean map, but it is the sum of all disorders. And some disorders have it, and some don't. And in schizophrenia, I guess there's a huge debate about how it is related to evolution of the human language, potentially, which is why the genes are still in the population, even though they're not in the official, <laughs> um, probably. Um, but yes, it is the prison of some disorders, but not the prison disorders. Yeah, that's great. I was <laughs> uh, just thinking about you know, because you mentioned semantics, Chris, and obviously semantics is quite a natural, but your effects being quite bilateral. Um, are there any aspects of the lateral transition you have had in the analysis? Any differences in the principal gradient between the two? Um, so we, uh, I, I, no, I don't remember any sort of lateral decision at the level of gradients. Um, but what did pop up, which might be of relevance even related, is when we did the we did the impulsive computation, which is an actual approximation of entropy on the EEG signal, uh, and we found uh, a significant, uh, actually kind of like an interesting left lateralized language region association, like network language network, uh, with global connectivity and this entropy measurable. So that was the closest. Of, um, <clears throat> Um, any other questions for us? Yes. Um, another question for Chris. Uh, you talk about the compression of language first gradient 
Have you looked at the uh, variance explained by this gradient compared to the control group and whether it was still a gradient that explained the highest amount of variance? And was there any perturbations of other gradients as well? Yeah, so I mean, with regards to the first question, maybe maybe Vanessa can. Uh, yeah, so it's a degree, still the same, just like the other. So it feels the crystal gray, you need more transmog, and the digital transmog, and then like a dark blue cast positive, it has a negative. So it's the same ordering. Uh, the the uh, variance explained for each was slightly less, uh, but not significant. Uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and uh, and I think the third grading was also uh, flattened in a very significant way, not so much the second. Yeah, but hold on, that takes a you have found my post graph, right? Then I have three second graphs from the boxer, uh, so I'll find out what you should share. And uh, what's interesting is that there's a difference in the principal grading are consistent across the three dots, but then I still have this stuff up here. But grades two and three, the differences are very different across the dots. So it seems to be that, uh, you know, uh, there's this high level pattern that's consistent across. Certain way I describe in principal gradients, but then the other gradients are slightly different each. And it's not necessarily consistent with different gradients. Before we get to the next one, can I just extend that question to Jess as well? Do you see a high variability within the patients than in controls? Um, well, they're all aligned to like a common template. So we try to like, at least, you know, make it so. We still have the same ordering of the gradients and they're as close as possible. Um, I'm not sure if they have more favorability in specifically in the variance explained. Not necessarily the variance explained, but also the gradients themselves. They're more variable in the animation cohorts. I'm not sure if anyone else is. Not that I could, not that I would remember. I didn't, didn't look at them in like so much detail at the individual level. Yeah, it was just a follow up. The question so I was wondering whether you also looked at some type of eccentricity. So, my combination of the three gradients uh, as a proxy for integration versus segregation of, of, of like your variability. Because I, I, mean, I can imagine that, like, if you're saying that it's the compression of the gradient, there might be like stronger integration of different regions in a, in a certain way. And so, you might find like, something also. Like, like, I mean, I haven't looked at it with gradients. Do you look at it, Vanessa? Are you talking about uh, in gradient space? The, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just the, yeah, just the distance, uh, like all the three dimensional form perception of the temporary. Yes, yes, I guess. Now, I did manage to do it on this one, yeah, but uh, interesting. Hmm. Well, there definitely is a compression in general speaking. So I think that you put me this in a gallery to this. So I have not figured out this data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful talk, Mike. I have like a question for you, possibly, because at one point you also showed the associations to the different functional processes between neuroscience decoding and the transdiagnostic map. And I was just wondering. No, the Enigma data are what they are. I think it's like a little bit of a, a, little bit of a shame that it's only available in EKT, but would they expect there maybe to be a, a, a stronger segregation of function process if you had a different population available, or would you expect this to generalize? Um, strongly in the sense that there would not be so many functions in the middle of the plot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would hope so. Um, many of the at least more unimodal uh, functional terms are quite well mapped to the rather smaller, like you know, the sensory views and the music and piano space, like this. Um, but yes, I would hope so. <laughs> but yeah, we cannot investigate it because, you know, in the data. <laughs> are you exploring for also with a genetic risk for the different disorders and then map this onto the, uh, onto the brain? They're so using PRS type analyses, and would you expect to not find it? In health controls, I mean? Yeah. Um, that would be super interesting. We are apparently not planning to do that. And I also think the result would probably not be the same because then you might really have patients with the disease manifestation and the patient effects in there. So they would probably be not the same, but similar. 
but I really don't know. Like it's really something we will have to get later. <laughs> 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 So you're investigating temporal lobe epilepsy looking for seeing changes in the temporal lobe, but also in the prefrontal cortex. Right. Um, I'm not like an expert in epilepsy, but it's very complex. I don't know why these effects are especially in the prefrontal cortex, but anywhere else. Not anywhere else. else. I mean, it's more higher order kind of region. Um, you know, there's some evidence to show that limbic and these temporal areas might be a little bit more susceptible to disease effects. Mm -hmm. So this could be a, an explanation. This I don't know if it's some the finding that could maybe generalize to like other epilepsy types, you know, more extra temporal epilepsy. Maybe we could find like some common uh, disruption in prefrontal area. It's a possibility. Um, we don't currently have like enough applications to kind of do this other disease control very much. But yeah, I think that like when investigating the, the histology, you can look at post surgical specimens in the temporal lobe, right on the arm of the surgery, and there's evidence of like microsexual changes in the surgery. But when you want to look at like more larger um, uh, microsexual changes, you can probably have also compounding effects if you want to look beyond the temporal lobe. Um, at least with the injury one, there seems to be something in there. And then something you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. One last question. Okay. Um, I have a follow up question to that first. Um, maybe this can't be answered, but if you had to guess, do you think that the microstructural changes you're seeing are more like causing people to have epilepsy, or something happens, people have epilepsy, and then they have damage from it and you see microstructural changes? Yeah, I think in the case of like temporal deficits, there seems to be like this possible interaction with like the microstructural damage that can be the campus, and you can have like also like an environmental factor. Like a lot of these patients have um, you know, develops um, epilepsy following like febrile seizures. So there's like some possibly external factors combined with maybe like, some uh, pre existing existing conditions that could worsen. So there seems to be like a uh, combination of like more genetic risk and external. Influences that uh, affect the microstructure and maybe uh, associated with the FFC. Okay, fantastic. It's fine. Cool. Three speakers for a brilliant answer.